It's really good to be here. I'm really happy to be on stage for you guys today. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, my, my concept of everybody wins. So if you don't know who I am, uh, Family Doc, I own a clinic in Northeast Kansas called Holton Direct Care that's growing way too fast. And, uh, and as you see, when you own your own clinic, you can give yourself whatever, whatever title you want. And so I, I just do that. So let's keep going here. I'm going to try to keep it moving. Um, Everybody Wins is the name of my talk. And if you, if you look at my clinic and what we do, I've got some of my staff members in these slides. And you can see our t-shirts there. Uh, Everybody Wins is right on the t-shirt now. The short guy in the middle is Daniel. He's my partner. And if you look at this picture, you realize that he has no idea what to do with his hands when he's in a picture. <laughs> and, and so he's, he's like this guy, you know, like, I'm not sure what to do with my hands. Um, this is our marketing. So we took this picture a few years ago. I do some bartering, and uh, one of the patients that I did a surgical procedure on uh, is a photographer. And I said, hey, you want a half price uh, vasectomy? And he said, yes, I do. And, and uh, he did a bunch of awesome photos for my staff. And then I said, hey, are you good with Photoshop? And he said, yes, I am. And this was the result. And so we have actually not used it in our marketing because we don't have a marketing budget because it doesn't seem to be something we need. But we are open for ideas on how to do a Step Brothers reference on a billboard. OK, some more staff members here. Beth didn't get the memo to wear the Everybody Wins shirts that day, so she doesn't have that. She's one of my other partners. And, oh, and that's her husband there that looks, it's like a mug shot. But that's Chris. He's a new, new member of our practice as well. He's a nurse. And uh, so Everybody Wins across the board for all of our staff. Now, this is my most important staff member. She's in the room. This is my wife, and she's our, our office manager. And I said, you need to wear your Everybody Wins shirt, and she did. But then she had to go like, pick up our kids or something, and we didn't get it done. And so I had to use a different picture, and I said, you're supposed to get Everybody Wins. And she says, I, you know, whatever, I couldn't. And I said, well, what are we going to do? You're supposed to have Everybody Wins for my talk. And she said, is Jeff Gold going to be there? Jeff, are you here? He's not here yet. He's on his way. He's probably getting off an airplane. And I said, yeah, Jeff will be there. And she said, well, then I'll just get it tattooed, because he's big into that. And so she got the Everybody Wins right on the neck which I know he's going to like uh, when he gets here, because he always wants us to get that Salveo tattoo. Uh, you can see it on my hat. You can see it on our website. And it's branding that I really like. And why? It's because I really believe in mutually advantageous relationships. So um, in my opinion, and I, I wasn't alive in those days, the, the, the physician-patient relationship used to be a pretty awesome thing. A lot of uh, mutual respect and uh, mutual benefit in that relationship between a physician and his or her patient. And then something changed. And I think most people, by the fact that you're in this room, know that. What changed? In my opinion, this is what happened. The relationship went, went, the relationship went from a relationship between two people to a relationship between three people. And uh, I would assume that most would agree that a lot of times if you're in a really committed relationship with someone and a third person enters the relationship, things get weird. And this is no different. I don't know who originally came up with this clip art. I stole it from somebody, some other doctor's talk from a million years ago. So if it was you, I used the, uh, so thank you. And uh, anyway, that's what the relationship used to look like. You got a patient, you got a physician, and you guys can decide which is which. The physician might be the one standing up. I don't know. But the point here is that it's a two-person relationship. But then insurance comes along, and it's just this sort of you know, I'm just here to help. Give me your money. And since medical care is so expensive, I'll just pay the doctor um, for you. And it sounds kind of good. I mean, we all like insurance. We have car insurance. It doesn't cost us much money. And if we crash our car, they'll buy us a new one. And it only costs us X number of dollars per year. That all makes sense if you do insurance right. But when you bundle really expensive things like heart surgery into the same insurance plan as a strep throat test, all of a sudden, a strep throat test becomes un something no one can afford. And uh, that's where this idea comes from. So all these people say, yeah, sure, I'll give you my money. And you can give some of it to the doctor. But let's be honest about who that guy is. He's a human being. And human beings are greedy. And this is what happens to your money. And so let's talk about that. And, and, and in my opinion, this third person that, that, that worked in his way into this relationship is relying on altruism of, of us. And now that's arguably a moral instinct. And I, I did a lot of research on the concept of altruism. And boy, that is a rabbit hole that does not have a deep, uh, an end. It goes deep and deep. It goes into philosophy and religion and evolutionary biology. 
And whether it's a moral instinct or not, we're not going to discuss. But I think in general, we want to help with people's wellness. We go into it for that reason. We want to help people out. And I really believe that that's being taken advantage of inside the system. So in that case, everybody doesn't win. But that's not my slogan. So I have to figure out a way to make everybody win again. So let's talk about what altruism is. And the, ma the main thing is it's a concern for the well-being of others. Now, Again, we'll, we'll talk about the ethics of it later, but we want to help people, and that's something that we do. So what kind of things, does, what are our resources to be altruistic? Well, the biggest one is time. You're going to have to help people. You're going to have to use your time, but that's a finite resource. It's, you know, family time, community time, personal time. Same thing with other resources like money, goods, even property. And what about compassion? We give a lot of that out. The thing about all these resources that are required in the application of altruism is that they, they have... They're finite. They have a certain amount you can have, and then you run out. And if someone takes it all from you, then what are you going to do to be altruistic? Well, let's ask our old friend, uh, who is that? Oh, yeah, it's Aristotle. He says, well, let's do some logic on this. Altruism is required for sustainable primary care, if. I think that's reasonable to assume. And, uh, and altruism requires finite resources and... In primary care, third parties abuse, steal, and waste those resources, then what? Then third party payer systems make primary care unsustainable, at least if you're doing it right. So, physicians lose in a set setting like that. And these are some sobering statistics, and I try to be fun and happy with my talks, but this slide is always depressing to me. That's, that number on the top is right off of last year's survey, I think Medscape survey, 24% of doctors or, or physicians, family, I don't know if it's family physicians or all physicians in that study, I think that one's all physicians, are depressed. One in 10 have suicidal ideation. And that third one is just about as depressing as a, as a, as a uh, slide number gets. But three or 400 of us kill ourselves every year. And if you're a woman, it's 130% higher than your age matched counterparts. That's ridiculous. And these last two ones are ones I'll talk about a lot, but half of us want to quit, and 63% would not recommend the physician to someone else. Those of you who are in this room who are DPC uh, providers, doctors who have been doing this for a while, I want you to raise your hand if before you did DPC, you would not have recommended that your kid become a doctor. See this, guys? And I'm right there with you. Now, keep your hand up if you still do not recommend that your, your patient become, your kid become a doctor. There's a few, it's still a hard job, it's a few, but most of us have put our hands down and I'm one of them. So that's, I don't know, those are sobering statistics and physicians lose. So this kid is me. And as you can see, I was not very old when I already was like, I gotta be a doctor. Since I was a little kid, that's all I wanted to do. And uh, so they give me this for Christmas and my poor family became my patients from day one. So there's my mom, and she had a stage three murmur. It was very scary. Luckily, I made the diagnosis quick, and we got her treated before things got, got worse. Um, there's my poor grandpa, and I guarantee you that smelled like peppermints. I, in my mind's eye, it did, because he always was eating peppermint, and he had really bad GERD because of it. And uh, that was the kid who really wanted to be a doctor. Fast forward 40 years. Here we go. There it is. Okay, so it ends with that. And this was, as you can tell, before EMRs came out, whenever I, was, I could make fun time-lapse videos of me doing my charts. But I'm not seeing patients in that, in that video. I'm, I'm just doing paperwork. Who am I working for? So we lose. And what kind of things do we lose? It's all right here. We lose a lot of time. We click boxes, do paperwork. What about the mental and physical and emotional toll? So when that really adds up, there's kind of a buzzword in this country for that. Anybody know what it is? There it is, right there. It didn't even take long. It's burnout. So this is, this is what happens. And if we think it's a thing, I don't know, let's ask, let's ask Google. So Google, uh, can you find me a picture of a physician who's, who's burned out? Is that, is that a thing that is on the internet? Okay, yeah, so it looks like, it looks like there are some. So Google has no problem finding me some models who are, uh, we call it stock photo models of doctors, and they really love to touch their face. So that's enough, Google. I, don't, I see that there's, okay, sure, there's more. That's Google, stop. We've got plenty of evidence of 
stock models. Stop. I get it. There is such a thing as physician burnout. You can stop. Google. Anytime. No. Thank you. We finally have enough. So but you got to wonder, like, why do they all have to touch their face? <laughs> Google, is there such a thing as doctors who don't touch their face who are burned out? <laughs> really? Just, okay. Nope, we have those too. There's plenty of them. That one on the bottom was me. How many times do you guys go to sleep in the ER? <laughs> over and over, except I never took my shoes off. Okay, uh, let's Google um, physicians who take insurance without burnout. Let's see what, uh, what there is on that. Oh. I really thought with all the billions of things on the interwebs, there'd be something there. I googled the stock photos. There's three main companies that sell stock photos to people who uh, publish online. And between the three main companies that do that, there are over six or 7,000 stock photos of physicians who are burned out. So basically models in white coats who touch their face. So what do we talk about? Why don't we talk about it? And, and I, I'm, I get into philosophy a little bit. One of my favorite philosophers is this guy, Walter Sobchak. He was really prominent in the 1990s. And, Walter, tell us a little bit about burnout, can you? Dude, burnout is not the preferred nomenclature. Moral injury, please. Really, moral injury, I, okay, I don't know anything about that. Tell me, I, I, no, I don't know if you're, I'm not saying you're wrong. No, you're not wrong. You probably are right, I don't know anything. Can, no, we're not gonna split hairs here, Walter. No, you're not wrong, you're just a, well, it's a family show. Just tell us about burnout, please. Well, he says that burnout suggests the source of distress resides within the individual who lacks resilience. The individual must therefore find and implement solutions. So what that is called, you guys, is gaslighting. This is your fault. This is your problem and yours and yours. It's your fault. You got to figure it out. So what kind of things, you know, would we be suggested that we do? Walter, what would maybe something like, like yoga? Is that, would that make it better? Okay, he says it is. So there's an example. So Walter, are you saying that if I find the solution within myself and I go find my meditation place and my yoga, that then I can not be burned out as a physician? Mm -hmm. He says, yoga, mindfulness, wellness retreats, and meditation won't fix prior os blocking care, no time to discuss, manage a complex diagnosis, a computer system that places metrics, coding, and reimbursement above communication. Heck yeah. That's exactly right. So, no, you're not wrong. All right, so we're gonna go with this term, moral injury. And that's a much better, better place. Now, this doesn't come from Walter Sobchak. This comes from a paper from three years ago by Dean Talbot and Dean, and they define burnout as something that occurs when we perpetrate, bear witness to, or fail, oh, sorry, sorry, or fail to prevent an act that transgresses our deeply held moral beliefs. So. Another word for that, in my opinion, would be violating the conscience. I can just summarize it to conscience violation. And so when this happens, it usually happens to something that we can't control. So it's simultaneously knowing what they need, but being unable to provide it due to constraints beyond our control. The question is, and this all comes from that paper, the question is, who do we take care of first? And if you look at the six things, if you're inside the system, you are expected to care for all of those things and probably in not necessarily the right order. And we all know there's only one answer to that question. It's patience. We take care of patients. We take and put our stethoscope on our mom's chest when we're three years old. We want to take care of human beings. Those other six things take care of other people, particularly, obviously, middlemen. So I hope I've made the case that moral injury is the result of a broken healthcare system, not evil doctors or Dr. Evils. So let's ask Morpheus. This is a little slide I added because I want to emphasize something here. So Morpheus says, uh, <clears throat> if I can channel my inner Morpheus, fate, it seems, is not without a sense of irony. We have rediscovered a system, which is direct care, that prevents moral injury, which was formerly incorrect, incorrectly labeled burnout, that itself can cause burnout. I'm not going to talk about that. Dr. Haynes and Dr. Uh, uh, Neil and, and, and Delicia are going to uh, do this tomorrow, and it's going to be a great talk, so don't miss it. But I just want to point that out, that we can still overwork ourselves. So physicians are clearly losing. 
Well, what about patience? I mean, it's, it's a two-way street, right? The, it's a two-person relationship we discussed, and I want them both to win. So yeah, they're losing two. So first of all, they're commoditized. They're no different to the minds of those third parties than pork bellies or a bushel of wheat or something else that can be bought or sold or used to make money. These are human beings, not commodities. And the same is true for doctors and all the other medical staff across the country that are suffering. So what has the system done? It has prioritized procedures over cognition, caring, and communication. Obviously, it incentivizes volume over quality. And the poor care is incentivized and rushed. We can all agree on that. Look at this. This is a bunch of uh, um, headlines that I found off, off of the interwebs. Took about five minutes to put all these together. A 10-second Google search found all these headlines about people being overcharged. And I actually got photocopies of some of them. So one is uh, brief emotion. So this patient was charged $11 for crying. Not even kidding. I think maybe she was getting ready to get put to sleep for surgery and she was upset and it slowed things down. So they charged her for it. How dare you cry before we cut your body open? This is a good one. This patient was charged $40 so she could hold her baby. Not even kidding. And then uh, Emily Silverman, are you here? I can't see. She's here? Like I'm blinded, but, I, but wel welcome wherever you are. Um, this is your hospital, I understand, Zuckerberg. By the way, basically hi to the world famous, uh, uh, not blogger, what do you call it, the kids do on the, the interwebs, the, uh, yeah, the, the social medias or whatever. All right, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is a almost, what, $3,000 bill. This guy got one stitch, y'all. <laughs> one stitch for a tiny cut. And it's itemized, it's right there. I mean, the tetanus shot itself was three, what, 300 bucks or something. It's ridiculous. One stitch, $3,000. So everybody's losing, not just doctors, not just patients, but the whole system. And if you look at this, it kind of shows some of the system statistics, but there's a widespread waste of resources that would melt my brain if I tried to think about how much money that is. So, uh, and not to mention the access issue with limited uh, and quality, in, un, poor quality care, and it's worse for the, uh, the socioeconomically disadvantaged. So there's losers, and I try not to use a lot of memes in this talk, but I had to use that one. Because there really are, it's just everyone's losing, and I want to win. So I don't know how we can do it. Um, but first of all, we have to, I mean, I, obviously I do. So I think I do. Social solutions to memorial injury demand changes the business framework, because it's not the doctor's problem here. They were doing it right without, without limitations to these relationships until the business framework changed. So that's what I, I think needs to change. So the, here's how the government says we do it. And what's weird about this picture is it's not something, and it's been, it's been on, the st on the screen at, at DPC conferences before. This isn't something that someone made to make fun of the government. This is something the government made to brag about their system. I downloaded this just a couple days ago from the government website. And that's how they lay out the ACA. That's what it looks like. And the, down in the lower left corner is physicians, and then the upper right, or the lower right co corner, I think, is, is patients. And all the rest is middlemen. I don't know, I think that looks a little complicated. After they, after they turned the AC on, ACA on in 2010, you can see where the AC was, tra uh, you can see where United Healthcare was, tr was trading below the Dow Jones in index. And over the next 10 years, they went up by what, 400% plus? And that was before COVID. After COVID, they went up another 200% because nobody went to the doctor anymore and they still paid the premiums. And how many of you got a reimbursement from your insurance company, your own personal health insurance company, because you didn't go to the doctor during COVID. So add a couple of hundred percent more to the growth of these companies. There's your money. So Thomas Sowell's a genius. If you guys haven't read him, I suggest it. He does have over 40 books, so it's gonna take you some time. I haven't read them all either. This is a great quote. He says, it's amazing that people who think we cannot afford to pay for doctors, hospitals, and medication somehow think that we can afford to pay for doctors, hospitals, and medication and a bureaucracy to administer it, which is, that's some stone cold logic right there. Aristotle would approve. This, ta this uh, slide you guys have seen before, most of you, if you've been to a conference of ours, and it, there's the expense. So in, in 40 years that they kept these numbers here, physicians went up by double the numbers, 100% growth, 3,000% in administration. There's your money. Why don't we Google benefits of healthcare bureaucracy? searching here, 
searching. Come on, Google. Uh, it's not doing good. There it is. <laughs> Did you mean ways to enjoy a root canal? Mm, this is deep philosophy, Google. I think what they're getting at is there's no way to enjoy a root canal. So there must not be any benefit of a healthier bureaucracy either. So here's another genius. Bucky Fuller has this great quote that we quote a lot in this, uh, in this field, and that is, you never change things by fighting existing reality. I use this quote so often I have a macro for it. Josh, if you're here, I know you'd approve. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Good idea. This is what we call it, and that's what it feels like. I'm going on vacation with my family in a couple of weeks, and one of the places we're stopping on our awesome cross-country road trip is the, uh, the prison where they filmed Shawshank Redemption. And I'm going to get to do the tour and see all the, uh, the sights from that movie and like pose like in the same room where Andy Dufresne crawled through the hole in the wall or whatever. Uh, I don't know if I should do a spoiler on this. Anybody not seen Shawshank? It's currently ranked number one on the number, there's at least one hand. Should I spoil it for that one person? I should. Someone's over there like, if you haven't watched that, you've been living under a rock. You lost. Too late. Uh, it's what it feels like. This guy climbed, he escaped from prison and he climbed through a, you know, a half mile sewer pipe to get out. And after decades of being abused, uh, he was imprisoned uh, for a crime he did not commit and was abused for decades and he finally broke out. And when he crawled out of that pipe full of sewer water, he came out in the rain and there's this very you know, classic scene of him uh, figuratively and literally being washed clean. And I got to say, that seems like hyperbole, but most, most people who endured a fair amount of moral injury who got into direct care will tell you this is what it feels like. So how's the, how's the payment model work? Well, there's a low monthly membership fee. The doctor opts out of Medicare. That allows you to take care of patients all the way up to death. No insurance contracts. And instead of middlemen, the market drives the cost. So patient satisfaction and the value is what drives it. So this is uh, that, that, that cartoon that somebody else made. I edited it a little bit because I really like to put the Monopoly man in there. This is on the inside. This is how the system works. So you'll notice how the patient is giving money to the insurance company and to the government. And what a lot of people don't know is the government turns and gives a lot of that money right back to the insurance company who administers their plans. And then now, what's his name? Professor Moneybags or something? The Monopoly man actually has a name. Uh, money bags is sitting there with the money and he has to decide whether the doctor can have any of it But remember he's a human being and therefore greedy So he's gonna do his best to hang on to it So in order to give the doctor for the doctor to be allowed the privilege of being paid for taking care of his patient He has to look at that chart and he has to massage it just right and click just the right boxes and Code it just right and all of that and then maybe he'll get some money well, What is the problem with that? And if you ask me, there's a lot of problems with it, but the biggest one is which direction that doctor is looking. He's not looking at his patient. He is looking at the chart. That is not your patient. And charts aren't even worth anything anymore. How many people have gotten a chart of any kind from inside the system that's even useful? Can't even trust it, right? A few years before I, a year or two before I left, I once, uh, I gotta tell this story really quick. I'm doing all right on time. This was an ear, nose, and throat doctor who sent me a, uh, a report on one of my patients, a seven-year-old who had had uh, ear surgery, just had tubes or something, and he went in for his annual checkup, and um, I got the report. I was sitting at my desk at, you know, 1.30 in the morning, and I'm reading through the paperwork, and it says, uh, hey, you know, Dr. Lassie, I saw your patient. His ears are good. He's good for another year. Uh, the rest of my exam findings are in the note. Thank you very much. Sincerely, Dr. ENT. And below that, it had the most thorough physical exam I have ever seen. It was like an internal medicine doctor would do if the doctor did peds. Every system was checked. I mean, abdominal sounds, musculoskeletal stuff, edema. I mean, really? The ENT checked my kid for edema. That's awesome. That's thorough, thorough ENTing right there. I was a little skeptical, but I like to believe that we are people who strive to serve our fellow man. So I was like, maybe he's just a really thorough surgeon. Happened to be in the patient's room two weeks ago, two weeks later doing his annual uh, well child check and his mom was there and I was making small talk as I examined her son. And I said, you know, it's almost, uh, it's almost unnecessary for me to be doing this exam. And she's like, why? I said, well, I got the report from the ENT surgeon about how thorough it was. 
And she looked at me like my hair is on fire, which is a weird way to look at a bald person. <laughs> and I said, well, I got this report from the ENT that was this glowing exam of all the stuff. I mean, I consider myself a thorough physician, and I don't recall ever doing an exam that thorough on a child. And this guy did it, and all he really needed to do was check his tubes. And she looked at me, I'm telling you. She looked at me into my soul. Is this all right, Sterling? Am I making you uncomfortable? That doctor never touched my son, and he was in the room for less than 30 seconds. We can't trust that medical chart. Why does it look like that? Does that guy want to lie? Probably not. It's moral injury. He's being made to lie. He clicks the button that says everything's normal, because why? So some middleman can make money. So here's how we do it. We cut out that middleman, and we, re, we realign incentives. So now it works like this. The patient just gives the money to the doctor. <laughs> wait, wait, you exchange money for goods and services? This is crazy. She can still give some money to the insurance guy and to the government, and that will cover her when she needs heart surgery or gets cancer or something like that. But primary care relationship does not have to be expensive. And that's what we do. For less than the cost of a cell phone bill, that patient is winning. No co-pays, unlimited visits, technology visits, wholesale savings on labs, prescriptions, imaging, supplies, plenty of time. Procedures are included, at least most of them. Same day, next day appointments, and employers can save a lot of money too. All right, so back to Morpheus. How deep does the rabbit hole go? Well, there's their hospital, turning me, us and our patients into a cash machine. Check this fake price out. So this gal, uh, I don't know who she is. She's some kind of famous blogger or tweeter or something. And she blogged out or tweeted out that her hospital stay was billed out at a half a million dollars, which is reasonable. She had brain surgery. And brain surgery probably shouldn't be cheap. And that 56000 that the insurance paid probably is somewhat fair. I don't know what her brain surgery was for, but probably wasn't anything good. But what about all that? What about that adjustment? What about that number right there? There's your waste. What if you don't have insurance? Then you are one of the 66% of the people who are bankrupted by the medical system. When I say 66%, I mean 66% of people who, can, who, who file for bankruptcy, it's medical costs that cause their bankruptcy. So a lot of people don't think that this procedure can be done. By golly, that middleman is like a heart or kidneys. You can't do a therapeutic metal manectomy. There's a lot of people in this room who will disagree because they perform that surgery all the time. Is that you, Nick? Yeah. Nick does this procedure. He's a procedure-heavy doctor. He has his own middle manectomy variant. I don't think I talked about your variant, Nick, but I would love you to write me a variant that you do, and I'll put it in my next talk. There's a classic bliss technique a lot of people know. This has been done quite a while in direct care. There's the endoscopic middle manectomy with the Neuhoffel viral transmission. So the way you do this middle manectomy is you make videos of yourself cutting out the middlemen, and then they go viral. And then there's the farigo gold middlemanectomy with salveodesis, or be well desis. And so what that is is you cut the middleman out, and then you stick to them a be well. There's the Lassie Champy peer-to-peer -peer claim reviewer novo anostomy. This is a good one. I like this one. So the way this works is you got some retired or sold-out doctor who works for some insurance company denying claims all day long, screwing people over. And in order to cover the thing that your patient really needs, you got to call them up and get their permission. It takes two weeks to even get them on the phone to have that peer-to-peer -peer claim deal. And what you do is you tear that doctor a new, wait, you do a novo anostomy, which means you surgically give them a new anus. <clears throat> but then it still doesn't work, and so you do a post-op middle manectomy anyway. There is no rock that middleman can hide under. Ground middleman is another good way to do it. So this is the middleman otripsy, and the Walsh Purcell method is fantastic. So what you do is you use, you use uh, middleman otripsy to just crush and liquefy the middleman, and then you suck it out using middleman synthesis. This is one of the less invasive middlemanectomies that I recommend. There's the Heritage Forbush middlemanectomy with post-op hopeplasty. It's really great when you add hope after the middleman is gone. So that's one that a lot of us have incorporated into our middlemanectomies. Uh, Garrett and Blackwell have a great one 
which is the ketosis gener ge generated middleman dysentery. So what you do here is, this is a real middle, a middle manectomy you only do on obese patients and people with metabolic syndrome and diabetes. You put them on a hardcore ketosis diet and then all of those problems go away and they don't need the middleman anymore and they just poop it out. Okay. Computer assisted number variation, also known as the RAND procedures out there. And there's so many more. This is the one I've been working on the most lately. Now what this one is, is a twin middle manectomy and it's very challenging. You see the twins there. The one on the left is the, uh, the insurance guy. The one on the right is the government guy. And uh, they're twins, but you know, they can be removed. And you can see my student on the left, me on the right, and we have successfully removed them. I, I'm happy to say that neither of them survived. <laughs> what are the benefits of this procedure? Well, look at some lab prices here. These are just prices from uh, the D DPC world on labs, and I won't make you read all of them or compare them, but you can see that I averaged up those, this is the 10 first ones I grabbed, 94% savings on labs. Medications are the same way. I'll, I'll just pick one. Uh, Flomax, 99 cents for a month, month's worth of Flomax, 2150 at the big box store. Overall, there's an 83% savings there. So sometimes these numbers get so weird and so big, it's hard to think of them, it's like the American deficit or something. And so I like to think about it in terms of things that I, that I understand and, and I like cars and can't afford a Bentley, but boy, if I could, that's what I'd drive. Because I need one. <laughs> now that's of course defining need the way Americans define need, which is really want. This is 2022, I actually updated this talk. I used to have like the 2016, which, you know, Nothing wrong with that one either, but $275,000 car. And it, you know, it's a 12 cylinder engine, it'll get you up to 200 miles an hour in luxurious comfort. But for $275,000, I can't afford one. But if I could get the discount that my patients get on labs, I'd have three of them. Because I could get a Bentley for 16 grand. So what about insurance? So our patients are encouraged to have insurance. We recommend high deductible, low premium stuff, health sharing, self-funded, catastrophic plans. Because once again, you don't need to cover all the stuff I can do for you. When I can get you MRIs for $250, you don't need insurance to cover it. It's the same way insurance works in pick something. I mean, your car insurance doesn't cover oil changes, new tires. Imagine how much your car insurance would, would cost if it did. Not very many people wrap their, their car around a tree and need a new car, but everybody needs new tires. Everybody needs an oil change. And if everybody was using their insurance for that, Nobody would be able to afford their insurance. Your insurance would cost more than your car. It's the same with, with direct primary care. Primary care physician relationship does not have to be expensive. And so you can cut out coverage for all of that stuff, get it down to coverage just for the catastrophic needs. Why not good insurance? Quote unquote, good insurance. There's the question, is, is good insurance good? And I often when I give this talk to medical students and residents and stuff like that, uh, I go into this a little bit with a lot of good insurance myth talking points that I got from one of my heroes, Chad Savage, who is in the house and is going to be giving that talk today, so I don't have to do it. And he does it a million times better than I do anyway. But you should go to it. Now, uh, this is a little meme I found, and this is true. For the typical family, chance of spending 10000 on health care in a given year is 3%. Chance of spending 10000 on health insurance, 100%. Now, I'm no calculus teacher. Something seems backwards there. Okay, so everybody wins, but here's the problem. Winning isn't easy. So a lot of people, when they talk about uh, something they're trying to teach that you know, someone they maybe want to pick up uh, some tips on and consider, they'll a lot of times say, well, there's pros and cons to this. And that's not a bad thing to do. But I'm talking about winning, and uh, I don't think there's cons to winning. <laughs> But there are challenges, and so when I think of winning, I, I guess I go into athlete mode, and I think about training. To win, you, all these good things happen when you win, but you, you, just, you didn't just step out and win one day. You gotta work for it, and you gotta train. So let's talk about the winning, first of all. Well, first of all, you might find your people. You get your life back, get rid of all these third parties, care for patients' rights, stop clicking boxes, better job satisfaction, your conscience gets healed, eventually you make some money. You get to ex expand your scope, right, Nick? You get to act like, I don't know, a doctor, not glorified insurance claims person that just checks boxes all day long. So there's the training though. There's hard work. It can be time intensive. A lot of us will tell our patients that we're available virtually 24 hours a day. Um, 
this hour doesn't happen to be one of mine. You know, my, my, staff, my, help, my uh, staff is helping cover for me today. But in general, my patients know they can get a hold of me all the time. They don't bother me at night very often or anything like that, but it can be time intensive. But you're a doctor. You didn't go into this thinking it was going to be easy and, you know, nine to five job necessarily. Lots to learn. There's a lot of haters to overcome. Delayed gratification, sacrifice. You got to overcome self-doubt whenever you take a leap of faith. We all did that. There's unique challenges, whether you start your own care, your own practice or join another one. But the bottom line is what Martin Friedman said, and Milton, I mean, Friedman said, isn't that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So you got to train. A couple little cartoons, and we have some time for questions and things. Um, this is a great cartoon, and uh, it says it all, really, but I, I've been showing this cartoon to medical students for years, and uh, after like fifth or sixth time I gave this talk, um, I, I occurred to me uh, that there's more than the, the basics on this. You've you got these doctors who are pushing this heavy load, and the other doctors saying, hey, man, check out these round wheels. You should give this a try. And I, ah, we're too busy for that. And we can all see the logic behind, uh, the, the, the lack of logic behind their, their denial of help. Because you get the new wheels, you'll make a lot better time and you'll much pass, go much further than you would have ever gone before. But that's pretty common sense. What I didn't notice until the fifth or sixth time I gave this talk was that, that little guy riding, does this, this, this work? Can you see that? See that little guy right there? That is an administrator. <laughs> because that administrator ain't doing no work. Is getting all the benefit. Here's another one. Why would you do this? Right? Just stop. Take a breath. Realize that everything you need, you have. You just need a chance to get it implemented, and your life will get better. Okay, let's see what's next. I added a few things. So this is me again, and uh, you, can see, you can see my dream. Started at a young age. Still have it. It was pretty cool. And then that happened. So that guy that's on both pictures told his little girl, no, don't do it. It's not worth it. You won't be home. You won't see your kids grow up. You won't be yourself. The job will change you. You'll treat people bad. Don't do it. But then, I heard about this DPC thing. I'm like, well, I'll smile a little bit, put a thumbs up. This might work. And then before you know it, I was smiling. And then before you knew it, I was happy. And then that little girl became a 13-year-old girl who got to see her dad now and then again after the first nine years of her life, didn't even know what I looked like hardly. And then when she was 12 years old, when she could have anything she wanted for Christmas, she asked for that. And you better believe I bought her one. Three days ago, as I was writing this talk in the middle of the afternoon in clinic, I got this text from my 13-year-old daughter. And it has her interrupted sutures on it. And she said, how did I do? And of course, I coached her through it. And I said, you did better than most of my fourth years, especially since none of my fourth years did any medical practice in the last two years because of COVID. And they were all at home. So if next time I have stitches, I'm not calling a medical student. I'm calling my 12-year-old. And I said, well, let's get started on horizontal mattress sutures, because why not? So I want her to be a doctor now. That right there says enough about what's changed for me, if you ask me. So you can heal the moral injury. You can practice without violating your conscience. You can love your job. And you can be the doctor you always wanted to be. You just can't do it working for someone other than your patients. Direct primary care is not easy. You might find your people, and we're helpful. Ask anybody. We are a family. It's worth the, the risk and the work and the leap of faith. It's rewarding in so many ways. So um, I do have one more little video I think we have time for. Um, let's see if it'll, if it'll play before we 
go into questions and answers. Here we go. And I'm going to hit play and see if this works. I made this a few years ago. Hold your applause for the, the voiceover work. I know how good it is. I know. At last. Welcome, Doctor. As you no doubt have guessed, I am Reason. It's an honor to meet you. No. The honor is mine. Please, come, sit. You may have also heard me called common sense or not stupid. You can call me any of that. Administrators have kept me out of medicine for years, so I might be new to you or many of your colleagues. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole, hmm? You could say that. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts the ugliness of medicine because he does not think it can be fixed. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Do you believe in government and managed care oversight, doctor? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my practice. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something is wrong. It's tough for you to explain, but you felt it your entire career. There's something wrong with medicine. You know what it is, but don't know how to get out. It's there, like a splinter in your mind, stealing your joy of practice. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix? Do you want to know what it is? The metrics is the system. Administrators, government, and corporations making you click boxes instead of care for patients. You see it in the faces of your peers and poorly cared for patients going bankrupt. You can feel it when you don't want to go to work, though you know you could love your it is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, doctor. Like everyone else, you were trained and hired into bondage. To a prison you cannot smell or taste or touch. Prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the metrics is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and you practice however you want to practice. You take the red pill, you discover direct primary care, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering you is the truth, nothing more.
All right. So that that was a least, that was a little teaser I made a few years ago when we when we launched the Alliance. And um, you guys, if you want to use that aafp.cnf.io, you can you can submit questions. And I got a couple. Looks like I've got a few minutes here, so I'm happy to answer some to the best of my ability. Now I'm already getting trolled by my friends out there, which is exactly what I expected. And I, and I appreciate, and the question is, have you considered checking your growth hormone level? And the answer is no, I never have, but I, I check my insulin level a lot. It came down from 14 to two, so you can ask me about how to do that. Um, I love hospital medicine and was a hospitalist in COVID. I am, man, that, that'd be brutal. I am leaving, that's smart, right? Already on a good, good, good trajectory. And I would like to continue, is there any way to, oh, hang on, my screen's jumping around. Is there any way to do DPC and be enrolled in Medicare? If so, how? So the answer to that question is yes. Uh, and the second question is, the second part of it is how, and that is, I don't know, but it's really hard. So uh, there are ways you can do hybrid models where you kind of, I don't even know, you almost have two different MPI numbers. You take care of uh, all your patients on a cash basis until they turn 65, and then they flip over and they join your, your Medicare practice. Um, and I know one doctor who does this, uh, now, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. I know one doctor who used to do this and he told me that he spent $27,000 on legal fees to set that arrangement up. To put that in perspective, I spent $0 on legal fees to set, to, legal fees to set up my practice. So yeah, it can be done, but it's not easy. But if you don't opt out of Medicare or figure out how that hybrid thing works with you get dual NPI numbers and whatever, it's almost like in Kansas, um, uh, I don't know if this is still the law, but in Kansas, liquor stores used to be able to only sell liquor. I think it may still be that way. I don't know. So if you wanted to sell stuff that went along with that, like that was liquor adjacent, like, I don't know, solo cups or ice, you couldn't. So what they all did was they actually had two different businesses, shared one building with a wall down the middle, two separate doors, and they, they had two separate cash registers. You go into one room and and then, you know, buy your, your beer or whatever. Then you go to the next room across there and you buy your ice from a separate separate company. There's something along the lines of that in a, in a relationship that doctors can make with, I don't even know, dual NPIs or whatever. I just know it's complicated. I do know that if you do not opt out and you don't figure out how to do a hybrid like that, then you have to find yourself um, turning loose your patients when they go on Medicare because it is uh, illegal if you're opted in not to be paid by Medicare for the care. So these are better questions for Phil, and Phil will be up here talking, um, I'm not sure, today or tomorrow, and um, he can answer these better than I can. But the answer is yes, it's a little bit complicated, uh, and even those who have done it often end up transitioning back out. The bottom line is you wanna be able to care for everybody. You don't wanna to have to turn people loose whenever they uh, turn 65. And to be honest, if you did, I would be one of the people criticizing you for abandonment, like kinda, like maybe I wouldn't, but. I understand it, it's, it is what it is, but in general, um, most people who start that way work their way to complete freedom from middlemen. So um, let's see if I find another question here. Um, I think I can also check these off, and um, there's another one. How would you prepare people to claim that if we are all do DPC, there won't be enough FPs? Oh yeah, so that's the uh, patient abandonment ar ar argument, which is, well, if all of us uh, only take five or 600 patients, there won't be enough of us. Um, and that, that's one way of looking at it, I suppose. But here's the thing. If I didn't go to DPC, I went from taking care of 3,000 people or whatever it was down to the 600 or so I have now, I would be taking care of zero because I would have quit. And you saw that slide earlier, 60% of doctors want to quit. So I would argue that which would you rather do? Would you rather take care of 600 people exceedingly well 3,000 people really crappy or zero people because you burned out and quit. Right. Take care of 600 people and do it right. Now, that doesn't mean the system doesn't need to figure out a way to train more physicians. I think we can all, we can all argue we need more residency programs and all that. But we have no moral obligation to suffer. We don't. So that's, that's the other way I answer that question. I've got eight more minutes, Bethany, according to this thing. Yeah, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Let me find one more question. That's a lot different than eight, eight minutes and 47 seconds that my timer says. Um, 
No, this one's got four upvotes. We'll do this one next. Um, what do you recommend to a free a FFS doctor, fee-for-service doctor, contemplating DPC, who's trying to figure out how to let their patients know without soliciting or breaking contract rules? Well, I just break them, but that's me. Um, you're not soliciting if your patient asks you what you're doing. You're answering their question. I ran into this when I worked at the hospital. I worked in a hospital for nine years, and um, the CEO's mad about, you know, she was always mad about something, and I always challenged her to fire me. For God's sake, put me out of my misery. Fire me. Write me that juicy severance check so I can use it to start my DPC. No, she's too smart. She's not going to kill the golden goose. Um, the answer is, in my, in, in my opinion, uh, if your patients ask you, you're not wrong to tell them what you're doing. But the truth is, when you're on the inside and you're still trying to crank through 20 plus patients a day in clinic, you don't have to give all of you don't have time to give all of them your DPC elevator pitch. Which, if you don't have one, you'll develop one. So all of us have a way to kind of tell people what we do in 30 seconds or whatever. You'll develop a pitch that's 30 seconds long. But what I did whenever I ran into that scenario was even if I wanted to just make the CEO mad and solicit, which I did, I didn't have time to anyway. So what I did was I launched my website ahead of time. My, my DPC website was up. And then I just had business cards that had our website on there. And when my patient said, I hear you're leaving, what's going on with that? And I explained, no, I'm not leaving. I'm just going across the street, blah, blah, blah. Here's how the model works. I don't have time to talk to you about it right now. I wish I did, but I've got a lot of people to see. I will have time when I'm in direct care. I don't have that time today. Take this card, go to the website. It's got a FAQ on there. The first thing I made when I made my website was frequently asked questions section that answered most of those patients' questions. So that's how I did it, because the truth is I didn't have time to solicit as much as I liked making the CEO mad. So there's more questions, but I think we're out of time here, it looks like. All right, thanks everybody, I really appreciate it.